Father, I come to you now. I pray over the rest of this service. I pray, Lord, we, we ask for the anointing. We know the anointing is here, but we ask and receive and yield to the anointing of your Holy Spirit. We pray for utterance, Father. Lord, Lord, that we need the right words. Lord, not just the right words, but we need them spoken from the right heart. I pray for the hearers. We need the right ears. Ears to hear. Ears to be open. Ears to be yielded. Even as we confessed earlier, we're quick to hear. And we're quick to obey. Ha ha. And we thank you for it, God. I thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I continue to stand upon your word. Your word says that I am confident that you are working in us. You have begun a good work in us. And you will perform it till the day of Christ. And Lord, even now we work out our salvations with reverence to you. Hallelujah. Fear and trembling, as the King James says. Well, for we know it's you that's working in us, both to will and to do your good pleasure. Lord, I praise you, God, for every person in this place. I praise you, Lord, that you love them. That you died for them. That you poured your spirit upon them and in them. I thank you, Lord, that you have a plan and a purpose for every person in this place. I thank you that you're using every purpose person in this place. I thank you for the blessings that are lined up and in store for every person in this place. Our desire is to grow in grace and walk in the fullness of them. Lord, not just the, the purpose and the blessing, but Lord, the source that we know you. That we know you intimately. That we know you personally. That you, that even as you call us friend, Lord, you are our friend. You're our father, but you're our friend. Hallelujah. We thank you for it, God. Praise you, Father. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 4, verse 32. While you're turning there, I'm just going to do a little exhorting. So don't stop turning just because I'm speaking. You get to go and find the verse. I want to encourage you real quick. This is, a, is something that has been stirring in me for a little bit to kind of encourage y'all with. Is, you know, when we preach and teach things as, as a body of believers as we come together, whether it's the Bible class, whether it's faith and healing school, or whether it's the main Sunday morning worship service, when we preach and teach things, a lot of times for the purpose of ministering the Word, we have to separate those things so we can concentrate on them. And what happens a lot of times, like the, all of us, is because they are compartmentalized for the purpose of teaching and giving, and, and, and giving instruction, we also compartmentalize it in how we use it and how we operate in it, how we flow in it. But the things of God overflow and overlap together. Like we spend a lot of time talking about the Spirit of God. And the flow of the Spirit and yielding to the Spirit of God. And, a lot, and then even as we've been, I've been sharing with you, I started last Sunday morning, talking about the Word of God. Don't separate them two. Like I use an example, praying in the Spirit. We spent many weeks uh, talking about tongues. Uh, we used Brother Hagin's book in the Bible class, Tongues Beyond the Upper Room, and, and spent many weeks discussing tongues. Not just that it's the evidence. It is the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Ghost, but there's so much more purpose to tongues. But I'm telling you that even now, when you get into your prayer time, also when you get into your word time, don't separate tongues from your word time. The Spirit of God is your teacher, and the Bible says that when we pray in the Spirit, that also in our personal prayer language, that we're also to pray and ask for interpretation. And the Spirit of God, as you begin to pray in the Spirit over your word time, opens yourself up for revelation by the Spirit of God. It opens yourself up for understanding. Your, your word time could increase exponentially if you mix it with your praying in the Spirit. But see, we, mesh, we don't mesh them. We think, well, this is my praying in the Spirit time, and this is my Word time. No, it's the Spirit of God that's our teacher. Does that make sense? A lot of revelation comes because we pray in the Spirit. 
These scriptures begin to lighten in front of our eyes. And you'd be surprised how much of it is because you've been spending time praying in the Spirit. When I minister the Word of God, when I expect these teachers to teach, and when I, whatever whoever's functioning in this, I believe that it's not just the mix of it's not just the study of the lesson and the study of the Word, but I believe they're mixing the study of their Word by filling themselves up and building themselves up on their most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Because if they're yielding your tongues in the Spirit in that area, they can yield their tongues here when they speak out to you. That's why we pray for utterance, right? Didn't Paul say, when we, especially when it came to ministering the Word of God, to, pr- to ask, to give him utterance? We don't want to speak in just technical understanding. I need utterance from the Holy Ghost. And we're not saying utterance in tongues, but yes, by yielding to utterance in tongues, it also gives you utterance in your understanding. I guarantee you guys... I, and I do this, and, and I know y'all know this, and I know that, that, that Doug and Juanita and, and Brother Ronnie and anybody else that you, we've seen teaching here, you start watching, and, and they'll actually say this, they begin ministering beyond their understanding. They didn't come prepared to say what they said, but utterance is kicking in. And it was the utterance that I needed. It was the utterance you needed. Glory to God. So when it comes to things like, I mean, I used I used the Spirit and I used the Word as an example, but when it comes to other things, start seeing how they all work together, how they all mingle together. Just because they're separated for the purpose of ministering and teaching and bringing a lot of understanding to, use your faith to say, okay, how does this work together? Praise God. Well, that was my two cents for today. We'll move on. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, me. What? Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you missed this past Wednesday, you missed some good stuff. I'm just going to be real straight. I've been enjoying Wednesday nights a lot. Hallelujah. I shared with Juanita and I shared with Doug. Man. I just had fun this past Wednesday. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, if you've given you plenty of time to turn to Luke chapter 4, I hope you're there now, because we're going to jump in. Luke 4, starting with verse 32. And they were assembled. They were ad- not assembled. Try to put this up here where the light shines on it a little better. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Are Are you come to destroy us? I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold your peace. Hold your peace is King James' polite way of saying, Shut up. (laughs) And come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him, And heard him not. And they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. Now, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 7.
Hallelujah. I'm going to my phone. I just need something with a little more light in it. We're working on getting more light up here. I already have a plan in place. All right. Matthew seven twenty eight through 29, it says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, if you'll go on over to, to chapter 8, starting with verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goes. And to another come, and he comes. And to my servant do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say to you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into utter darkness, There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go your way, as you have believed, so be it done unto you. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Now, these are the same scriptures I used last week. I'm continuing to to go on, and, 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 and I want to revisit what we started visiting last week. I want to talk to you about being conscious of the power of God's Word. Being conscious of the power of God's Word. Now I've got a few statements to give here. The Word of God is not just, or the Word of God is more than information. It's more than a collection of facts or trivia. See, notice in the end of Matthew 7, he says that he taught with one with the power and authority. Not as the scribes. See, the scribes taught like, kind of like they do in school. Where it was just information. No real authority, no real power behind it. Just the information. Almost like you're getting ready for a written test or oral exam. Just, hey, well, this is what it says. This is what you need to know. This is what we why we teach it. But that but there was really nothing behind it. Makes me think of I don't know if if some of y'all may remember this, some of y'all may not. Uh but it was an eighties movie called Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And you had that one teacher and, and he was just he was real dry, real monotone. And he, he was even in the process of taking role and he was getting there. And he got to Ferris's name and Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. And, I'll, I'll, I'll. and they were basically using that as an epitome to kind of show how those teachers were. Dry, monotone. Not every teacher's that way. I know that. But still, the te- sometimes just the purpose of teaching, even in today's society and culture, what have we been dealing with and what we even hear about, and I'm not really trying to come down on this, but it's just the true information to give you insight, is they find out that in Texas, a lot of times that they're teaching toward a test. They're not even teaching information to help them further in life. They're teaching them so they'll do well on a test, Right? I see some shaking of hands, so I, I hit a, maybe hit a few notes with people. Well, peop, they were doing that with the Word of God. But the Word of God is more than just information. It's more than a collection of facts and trivia. The Word of God is not, is not just, or the Word of God is more than inspiration. I'm not saying that the Word of God isn't information. I'm not saying the Word of God isn't inspiration. It is, but it's more than that. It's more than a pithy sayings to give an emotional lift. The Word of God is more than inspiration. It's more than pithy sayings to give you an inspirational lift. 
You know what I'm saying? That sweet, that, you know, some of y'all may have those scripture boxes. And I'm not putting down scripture boxes. You should have them. There's lots of people that are making profit off the word of God. And I'm not saying don't buy these things for your house, but you can buy things and put them on your walls and they're nice and pretty. And they always have just that right verse that gives that nice little inspirational. And really what it gives is it's supposed to give a little emotional lift. We need more than information. We need more than an emotional lift. The word of God is not a badge of honor to show religious or hope. How religious and holy you are. The word of God is not a badge of honor to show you how, how religious and holy you are. For it's not in the word you can quote. But in the word that is a reality revealed in your lifestyle as true demonstration of faith. In other words, it's not how much word you know. It's how much word you live. I've met many a people that can quote the Bible better than I can, and they're still going to hell in a handbasket. They didn't even believe on the words they're quoting. They're just highly intelligent and able to store the things in their brain. But they're not experiencing victory. They're not experiencing the goodness of God. They're not experiencing what the Word says. Because they're just showing off their intelligence. They're just showing off information. Some are just doing it so they can get that emotional lift. Just that nice little quotable thing. Some are using it as a badge of honor to show religious ways. Look how, look how religious I am. I can quote the Bible. I got some more as I was getting up here today. This was what I had prepared, and then all of a sudden more kept coming. So guess what? Y'all are going to get more. I was letting, I, that was more for Doug because Doug seen me got here, and I went over to the table and let him know that I had already had my message ready, and I didn't wait till the morning to start getting my message ready. It was just still flowing. He, he's, he, Doug's good with it. I'm just giving him a hard time. He needs a hard time from time to time. I don't give him a hard time very often. The Word of God is more than a suggestion or an option to choose from. When it comes to the Word of God, there is no plan B. And the Word of God should not be plan B. It's more than an option. Lord of God, I'll wait for these other stuff so that it's more appropriate time. So it's more than commu the word of God is more than a means of communication. See, we've limited our words to just conveying mind pictures, right? I'm hungry. I'd like a nice juicy cheeseburger. See, I just painted a mind picture to you to convey a thought and a communication. It's more than thoughts and communications. Though the Word of God is the release of God's thoughts, and He is trying to communicate with us, but the Word of God, it is power. There is power in the Word of God. Every time God speaks, He is releasing power. Every time the Word of God is released in faith, power is released. See, in Psalms 119, there's a couple of scriptures that I would like. Well, I'd like to just go over this whole chapter, but I would think I'd freak y'all out, so I, I won't. I did time it to see how long it would take just to see. 20 minutes. And that's if I don't stop. We know that's not going to happen. Hallelujah. I'll stop as the Spirit stops. But in Psalms 112, 119 verse 12, Psalms 119 verse 12, I'm reading now the Passion Translation, so y'all know. So if you're looking it up, it sounds a little different. It says, My wonderful God, you are to be praised above all. Teach me 
the power of your decrees. God, you, my wonderful God, you are to be praised above all. Teach me the power of your decrees. That is my prayer, and I want you to make that your prayer right now. If you, when you pray the Word of God, you're expecting Word of God results. And one of the things he says here is the psalmist, was. this was a prayer. Teach me the power of your decrees. If you go on down to verse 68... Verse 68, this again, I'm still in the Passion Translation. Everything you do is beautiful, flowing from your goodness. Teach me the power of your wonderful words. What we always are trying to accomplish here is we're trying, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to to operate, impart and operate in wisdom. In everything we do. And if you study the Word of God, it says that the wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. With the fear of God. Or the reverence of God. Reverence means recognizing how holy, how powerful, and how great He is. So we need to start... We cannot separate God from His Word. So if God is holy, His Word is holy. If God is all-powerful, His Word is all-powerful. And to show true reverence to God, we need to be conscious of how powerful His Word is. So everything you do is beautiful, flowing from your goodness. Teach me the power of your wonderful words. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. If you go to John 1 and go over to verse 14... And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What am I trying to show you? The Word and Jesus are the same. Jesus is the Word. He was the Word and He was made flesh. In other words, the Word of God had flesh wrapped around it and came and walked among us. Why am I telling you this? Because we've got to be conscious of how powerful God's Word is. We've got to be conscious of who the Word is. We've got to reverence the Word of God. We've got to give the Word of God its proper place in our lives. We've got to handle the Word of God as something precious and as something holy. We've got to get... Go to the hete, the hete. Why'd you do that? Because I couldn't say it in English. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. I know this is some of the stuff we said last week. I don't care. I'm good with it. Some of y'all don't remember anyway. Praise God. I didn't just preach the same message, though. I'm telling you, I've already been studying this more and got some more out of it. Hebrews 11.3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The things that are seen were made out of unseen things. Though things, the, 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 all of creation came from the Word of God. That's how powerful God's Word is. If you go back to Genesis, you can see the Word of God in action. He spoke, and it was so. Out of unseen things, He created seen things. And still, even today, 
I heard Sister Juanita this morning in that Bible class. She made that comment. She says, you frame your world with your words. If you don't like what your world looks like, you can change it by changing what you're speaking. Lining it up with what God says. Glory to God. So all creation, in fact, it's not just that the world was created by the Word of God, but it actually continues to exist by the Word of God. Because if you go to Hebrews 1, just right there at the beginning of that same book, in verse 3, talking about Jesus, which is the Word, and talking about His Word, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power. When He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. He is upholding all things by the word of His power. Even today... This building is still standing and we have electricity and all these things are working because the Word of God is still in operation. He is upholding all things by the Word of His power. The car you drove in was being upheld by the Word of God. The gas that flowed through it is being upheld through the Word of God. The, the ability to just walk on soil is happening because the Word of God is in operation. The Word of His power. Why am I drawing? I'm, I'm, I'm like making you look at the big s- scope of things. The sun is staying in its place because it's being upheld by the power of His Word, the Word of His power. All the planets in this solar system are making their way around because it's being upheld by the Word of His power. The moon rotates around this earth because it's being upheld by the word of his power. Well, sir, you're, that's, but, but the, really isn't that gravity? Gravity exists and is functioning because it's being upheld by the word of his power. Everything seen was created and everything seen is being upheld by the word. It says not only just his word, but the word of his power. We've got to be conscious of the power of God's word. Romans 1.16 says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the word or the message of that is released telling you about who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, what God has done for man through Jesus. Because in that message it says it is the power of God unto salvation. First Peter 1 Peter 1.23-25 lines that up. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flowers thereof fall away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. In John 6, 63, Jesus says, My words, they are spirit and they are life. Why does the word function in you? Why do you have the ability to function in the word? Because you are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. Why can you understand the Word of God when that when we talked about great intelligent people that have the ability that there's some people that can sit there and flip through this book and have the kind of eidetic memory that can sit there and start quoting every 
page of this book to you. But what good is that if they're dead in their spirit because this word is spirit and they are life. And dead things can't receive life. They have to have a revelation of who Jesus is. And then as they receive the word and the truth, then they can be born Again, they can be born from death to life. Because the gospel, the word of God, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's how I got saved. That same gospel is the power of God to your deliverance. That same gospel is the power of God to your healing. That same gospel is the power of God to your safety. That that same gospel is the power of God to your joy in the midst of your turmoil. That same gospel is still today working in your life. The gospel didn't stop working the moment you received it. That's when it started. And Jesus said, my words, they are spirit and they are life. We quote around here all the time, John 10, 10, that he's come that we might have life and life more abundantly. How do we receive more life from Jesus? My words, they are spirit and they are life. They are power. Romans 10, 17 says, so then... Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For we must believe He is, and He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Without faith, it's impossible to receive grace. Because when God imparts His grace, by faith we access that grace. All things are possible to them that believe, but believing comes through hearing the Word of God. And it's not just what you hear, it's how you hear it. The Word of God purifies us, cleanses us, Sets us apart. Ephesians 5, 26. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. See, this is a the scripture talking about that husbands love your, your wives even as Christ also loves the church and gave himself for it. He's talking about Christ's love for the church. He's talking about this is, this is how Christ continues to show and, and work in the church is that he might present it to himself, that he might sanctify it, set it apart, make it holy. And cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. If there's things in your life, as you get in the word, the word has the power to wash those things away. It sets you apart. It cleanses you. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. Mark 4, 4, Jesus says, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Luke 4, 4 says the same thing. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The word of God is nutrition. Where bread is just nutrition to your body and gives energy to your body, your, the word of God is nutrition to your spirit, it's nutrition and energy to your soul, it's nutrition and energy to your body. It is a full nutritious thing. Yes, we got to eat to take care of this body. The same way we've got to put gas in our vehicles and oil in our vehicles. We have to, we have to consume things to create energy for this body. But if you're still, if, if you're running on empty spiritually, you need to be full of faith, which means you're full of the Word of God and full of the Holy Ghost. 
If you're full of faith, you've got to be full of the word because faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone. It's our nutrition. We must feed upon the word of God. It is our source. Even as he said it's spirit and life, it is our source of life. We've got to get the mentality of how important, how powerful the word of God is that we start realizing I can't survive without it. I need it. It's precious. In Psalms chapter 10, I mean, I mean, it ain't Psalms 10, it's Psalms 103. I know that. Typed it wrong on my thing. In Psalms 103, verse 20. It says, bless the Lord, you his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening or listening or attentive to the voice of his word. Now we think that's all good and everything. Angels are moved by the word of God. But not only by the word of God, but by the word of God, the voice of the word of God. Romans 10, 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you actually study that out, it says the words of Christ, the anointed. The anointed words. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, you're part of Christ. You're the body of Christ. You're one spirit with Christ. And you're the person on this earth. You're the person that gives voice. You're the person that operates both in the spirit and in the natural. You're the person that has a spirit and you have, a, and you are a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a body, which makes us the most powerful force in this earth. Because as we yield and give voice to the word of God, even angels are moved by that. Do you want angels to operate in that? Then you you need to understand how powerful the Word of God is. Not just how powerful it is, but how powerful it is in your mouth. Well, what should angels do? Whatever you need. Do you need jobs? Send them angels out to get them. Do you need protection? Start speaking the word of protection over your life and give those angels, that gives them angels something to operate on. That's how powerful the word is. Even angels are waiting and listening. As soon as the word of God is spoken, the angels, it's almost like a cadence, and they go, ten hut, and they all rise to attention. The word of God is being spoke. And then once they hear the word, then they're... This is how important the word is to God. Isaiah 55, 11 says that his word doesn't return to him void. But within it has the power to accomplish what he sent it to do. All it takes is for you to operate in your life is to receive the word. Think about what Psalms 107, 20 says. He sent his word and he healed them. He sent his word. His word doesn't return to him void. So the word even right now is in operation healing people, those that will receive the word. Because in that word is the power. We've got to be conscious of the power of the word. Jeremiah one twelve, the King James says he hastens to his word to perform it. He hastens to over his word to perform it. Or the, actually what that means is he watches over it. And what it means by watches over it, he's not passively watching. He's paying attention to make sure my word will come to pass. Think about what it says in Corinthians when he says that all the promises of God in him are yea and amen and the so be it to the glory of God. Why? Because he says, I'm watching over it. 
All I'm looking for is those that will receive my grace. Because within my word, not only is it the word of his power, but it's also called the word of his grace. Mark 16, 20 says that God was working with, it says them, but that them is in italics. It says God was working with the word. Confirming the word. God was confirming the word with signs and wonders following. That's why we pick specifically. Now, we always are being led and we're trusting God. That's the whole point. This is where I'm, I'm going to do like Paul says. He says, I exalt my office. The point of having a pastor is, is not just having a generic word. Yes, you can go listen to teaching and it be anointed and it be a general word to the body of Christ in general. But when it's your pastor, he leads you to places that you're supposed to feed. It's a specific word for you. That's why there's different bodies and they may not be feeding on the same thing we're feeding this morning, but that's because that body needs a different feeding place. He says, I will give you pastors after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. But knowledge and understanding isn't just so you can pass a written oral exam. So you can show how holy you are or so that you can just communicate or that you can have it as a religious badge is so that the power of God is in operation in your life. So when the test of life come, you pass those tests because there's power within the word. In Matthew 12, 36, 37, Jesus tells us that we're to be careful with our words because it says with every idle word are we judged. Why am I saying that? Number one is to let you know that God doesn't release idle words. Number two, we are not to handle God's word as it's idle. As in has no power, has no ability, as we treat it like common words spoken. If we're not, if we're supposed to be careful how, how we handle our own words, how much more careful are we to be to handle the word of God? How much more? Matthew seven verse thirteen. I'm gonna read this. That's not the right one. But I can have it for you and just give me, bear with me. It's Mark 7, 13. I said Matthew 7. It's Mark 7, 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such things do you. Why did I bring this up? As I said last week, Despise in preference. Despise in loving. Despise means to give no value to. Preference means you choose something over another. What 
What you choose is what you give preference to. What you choose is what you give value to. What you choose, the Bible says where, where your heart is, your treasures are also. So where you, where, what you spend your time seeking and what you spend your money going after shows what you value. How does that line up with the traditions of men? You could come here week in and week out and make this a tradition. Hear the word week in and week out. Doesn't matter how anointed it is, but you've turned it into a tradition that you show up to hear the word of God. It's just church time and that's what we do. It's easy to fall into this. Why am I exhorting you this way? Why am I sharing this way? Because you've got to be conscious of the power of the Word of God. You don't have to have an emotion. You don't have to have a feeling. You don't have to be a goosebumps. But you got to believe, hey, when I hear the Word of God, there's power being released into me. When God, as I even shared last week, when God says, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, there's power within that commandment. Because that is a command, not an option. For the fulfillment of it. God doesn't tell me to do anything without giving me the power to perform it. But we go over words like that, and they may give us, like I said, the Word of God is more than inspiration that gives us just imparts a good emotional feeling. Many times we receive the Word of God, and as the Scripture says, we receive it with joy. But when times get tough and the, and the, and, and the things get hot, having no root in yourself, You've made the Word of God a tradition. You've made the Word of God. You, you may spend every day in the Word of God. You may pray. You may, you may read more than anybody else in this whole church the Word of God. You may read more than the pastor does the Word of God. But if you're not handling that Word with preciousness and with power... Believing God, Lord, I, I know that this word is powerful and I know that it, when I read this word, I'm believing the Holy Spirit to teach and impart this to me that I will walk in this word and see your word. See, the level of your faith directly correlates to how you esteem God's word. The level of your faith directly correlates on how you esteem, what kind of value you put on God's word, how powerful you really believe the word of God is. The effectiveness, the results you get, the effectiveness of your faith directly correlates to your perception or how you esteem the Word of God. Are they just nice words? Because the world's out there saying, yep, Jesus was a teacher. And He's just like one of the other many wise men that have risen up. And He's just one of the ways that you can get to God. And He said some nice flowery things. And we'll use the Word of God when we get married. Because, you know, 1 Corinthians, those are just beautiful words. Love is patient. Love is kind. The effectiveness of your faith, the, the results you get are directly correlates to your perception on how or how you esteem the Word of God. See, to get Word results in your life, to see the Word in your life, you must see yourself in the Word. To get Word results, you've got to see the, yourself in the Word. That is me he's talking about when he said that I, to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, praise God, He just empowered me and I am strong in the Lord and the power of His might. I don't care how I feel. I don't care what, what my emotions are saying. I don't care what my circumstances are saying. Even when he says, that if I do everything he says, even when it comes down to it, when I've done all to stand, I'll stand in the power of... I can stand. I can train my children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I have the wisdom of God because I have the Word of God and the power of God has operation in me. I can prosper because the Word of God is working in me and I yield myself to the Word of God. It is the fear of the Lord, but it's the beginning of wisdom. But wisdom will continue because I believe in the power of His Word and I am conscious of the power of His Word. I'm thankful because I'm conscious of the power of His Word. I'm thankful for the Word of God. I get up every day and say, Thank you, Lord, for Your Word. For Your Word is truth. Your Word is Spirit. 
Spirit. Your Word is life. Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I know which way I can go because of Your Word. This is the victory that overcometh the world. Our faith, my faith comes from Your Word revealed to me. See yourself in the Word. You get Word results. Value the Word, and the Word will produce what it's supposed to produce in your life. The Word doesn't return to God void, and it doesn't have to be void in your life. But if you give it, if you start being traditional with the Word, then you make your. It says that the tradition of men make the Word of no effect. In other words, render it powerless. When we start putting tradition over the Word. It renders the word powerless in our lives. When we make tradition of the word and we start making traditions that, that go against the word. Do not despise God's word. Give it prominence. Give it first place. Give it voice. Now, my challenge to you is this. Because how many want to love God's Word more? My challenge to you is this. Psalms 119. And if the King James is difficult to understand, find a translation that flows with you as you read it. But at least through this week, and maybe even you make a commitment for the next two weeks, or even for a whole month, take Psalms 119, and most people don't read Psalms 119 because they're intimidated by Psalms 119 because it's the longest chapter in the Bible. I read Psalms 119 this morning. It took me about 20 to 22 minutes. I use the Passion Translation. Psalms 119. Not just read it every day, but as you're reading it, pray it. Pray Psalms 119 daily. Give 20 minutes to the Word of God and allow that Word that's even in Psalms 119 to impart to you a love and a reverence for God's Word. Can y'all do that? Praise God. It's up to you. It's up to you. My part is up to me. Your part is up to you. Hallelujah. Praise God. I thank God for this day. Does anybody need anything?